So hi and welcome. Um, if you don't know me, I'm Anne James and I'm the Director for Children, Families and Safer Communities and Interim DCS in Bristol. Um, gosh, it is really lovely to see you all here. Um, and I really do respect what a dedicated bunch you are to be here on such a warm and sunny evening. Um, so we're here because, um, and I should thank the COVID-19 Race Equality Steering Group um, for bringing us together to uh, listen to Dr. Rosie Chiramateng's um, briefing on the paper that she's written um, into the international impacts of COVID for children. Um, we're going to record the session. I can see that Steph has turned on the recording. I hope that's okay with you. That's just so that we can share it with colleagues in future. Um, so, uh, pleasure to welcome you here and to introduce our time together with Dr. Rosie Chirimiting, who um, has just come back from leave, it turns out, so he's just <laughs> doing brilliantly to step into this evening's session. Um, she's going to take us through a recent paper on the international impacts of COVID for children, um, after which time we're going to have some time for discussion that Stephanie's going to steer us through. Um, and so if you have comments or thoughts or queries, you'll have a chance to raise your hand at the end, but you can also use the chat function if you want to capture them as you go. Um, and we'll try and uh, make sure that we, we sort of invite you to ask uh, a pertinent and themed question. Some people have asked questions beforehand and we'll try and capture our responses to those as well at the end. Um, so some of you may already know Dr. Chiri Mating um, and her work. She's the lead for the Voices of Children thematic working group in the International Society for Social Pediatrics and Child Health. And she's also um, an executive committee member for the British Association of Child and Adolescent Public Health. Um, as I say, Dr. Chiruma Teng is going to talk to us about COVID-19, race, culture and children's rights today. You also may have worked alongside her in her role in South Gloucestershire, because she's a consultant community paediatrician with Serona. Um, so uh, you're, Rosie, you are, what, what's that, four hats, three hats, four <laughs> hats that you wear. Um, and we're really lucky to have you with us. Um, I think I'm really interested in the paper that you're going to deliver to us today. Um, your work considering the unequal impacts on the pandemic in children and young people globally um, and its potential, which we kind of all know for the wider population, don't we, and theoretically are grappling with for children. I think it really lands, um, you know, the impact and the potential reversal of our progress in reducing global child health inequalities. It's really um, accessible and it's of significant value for us, I think, locally. It reflects the challenges we face and our work together to reduce those inequalities. Um, I'm really interested and really value the way in which you've aligned that with the Millennium and Sustainable Development Goals and the children's rights perspective that you've taken. So I'm really looking forward to hearing more on that because it really fits with us in Bristol um, where, you know, our approach is really about tackling inequality and taking a children's rights perspective. And that is a golden thread through all of our strategic work uh, and down into delivery. So the One City Plan is aligned with the majority of the sustainable development goals. Um, and as such, any adversity that jeopardizes our progress to delivery of those, you know, mandates us, requires us to reconsider, to revise our local system and to realign it to enable progress, us to regain progress against those global goals. Um, similarly, the Children's Charter, the development of which was led by our executive member, Councillor Helen Godwin for Children in Bristol, aligns with UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Your paper really echoes um, an earlier paper that I'm sure you're aware of, um, written by public health and university colleagues that focused on COVID impacts on children and young people in England 
And that too argued for a children's rights perspective that sticks to the accepted principles and was developed with and in the best interests of children. And our investment in children and their families in hearing children's views and securing their role in constructing the future is absolutely critical if we want to recover from COVID within a generation. Many of the mitigations that support children's rights have been considered on a week by week basis by local authorities um, and locally that's in our multi-agency COVID children and young people response now. But these are um, adverse impacts, they're likely to be long term aren't they? Disrupted systems and services for children, missed education, economic downturn, mental and physical health. And we're now in the adaptive phase of, and I didn't know how to term this really. So it, I termed it response recovery and business as usual, because we need to continue to consider those mitigations over the long term, to direct resources to those parts of our system where it's needed most, and to wrap around children and families and to continue to collaborate across our system and to be able to flex. Now I know that this is an audience you've been working throughout the past year to mitigate those adverse impacts um, and they've been staying connected with children, with families, you've all been flexing in your approach, thinking and delivering. Um, and seeing as I have you here, I guess I just want to um, recognize this audience and take the opportunity to say a huge thank you to you and your colleagues for your ongoing contribution to the multi-agency response that you've been a part of. I've definitely seen firsthand the impact of your dedication and collaboration and your ability to mitigate the worst impacts or the worst potential impacts for children and young people. Now, of course, we operate in an area of restricted resources and where families and services already suffer the continued impacts of austerity. So all the more important that we focus now on what will make a difference, whether that's fun, we need to fund wisely and join together in a shared endeavor to reduce health inequalities. In Bristol, the mayor's vision is one of a city of hope and aspiration in which no one is left behind. We know, don't we, COVID has amplified those inequality gaps and that COVID will have a long tail, particularly for our most vulnerable. We're refreshing, we're in the process of refreshing our corporate strategy to align all of our resources with reducing those inequalities and focusing on human rights. And if not now for children, then when? How will we recover it in a generation? And so, Rosie, I'm looking forward to hearing more from you, um, to the stimulating, to you stimulating our conversation, our thinking, um, and to hearing some of the evidence that you've considered. So on that note, let me welcome you. Let me ask you to take us through your presentation. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, and for sharing these um, uh, thoughts and views and, and actions that we've all been um, trying to put in place and consider. Um, I'll just uh, share my screen. Hopefully you can see that now. Okay, so thank you, Anne. So I'm uh, Rosie Cheramateng, a community paediatrician um, in South Gloss and Bristol um, area. And um, today, um, yes, so, so really, first of all, uh, let me just make sure my, okay, great. So, I mean, we're all familiar with, with what has been described as the COVID-19 pandemic um, that spread through the world in the last 18 months. And um, I'm aware that we have um, people here from um, different sectors, education, charities, the local authority, as well as health. So I just wanted to touch on a few basics. Um, a pandemic is a disease that spreads quickly across a large geographical area, like a continent or across the whole world. And this is different to an epidemic when a disease spreads quickly in a specific region, 
or an endemic disease that's present in a community all the time with a constant and usually well-defined number of cases. And in this context, yes, of course, COVID-19 is a pandemic. But I want to explain to you that COVID-19 is not simply a pandemic. COVID-19 is not just a pandemic, it's a syndemic. And a syndemic approach reveals biological and social interactions that are important for prognosis, treatment and health policy. In a syndemic, there may be two categories of the disease which interact. For example, within the adult population, COVID-19 and an array, an array of non-communicable diseases, such as diabetes, hypertension, and obesity. Um, these conditions are clustering within social groups according to patterns of inequality, which are deeply embedded in society and impact the presentation and morbidity from this disease. We must consider this in the context of there being a higher incidence of conditions like diabetes, hypertension and obesity in ethnic minority groups, Asian, African and Caribbean populations than among the white population in the UK. Uh, Raghib Ali, the government advisor on COVID and ethnicity, stated that most excess risk among ethnic minorities is explained by risk factors other than ethnicity. It's not that ethnic minority people won't be at increased risk. We still have those risk factors, but we have to address the risk factors rather than just saying it's ethnicity. Trish Greenhall, the Professor of Primary Healthcare Services at the University of Oxford, um, said in response to the Public Health England reports analysing the impact on different population groups, she said, it's encouraging that a government report is considering what might be called the structural causes of inequalities, as well as the possibility of biological ones. In other words, a person from a Black or South Asian background may be more likely to develop COVID-19 and more likely to become seriously ill from it. Not just for biological reasons, such as being more likely to have comorbidities, such as diabetes, but also perhaps primarily for reasons linked to poverty and social injustice. So if we relate this concept of a syndemic, which is the biological and social factors which impact prognosis, treatment and policy. To children, this means that limiting the harm caused by COVID-19 demands for greater attention to non-communicable diseases and in particular to socio-economic inequality and inequity. I'll just repeat that. Limiting the harm caused, by, caused to children by COVID-19 demands for not only greater attention to non-communicable diseases, but also, and in particular, to socio-economic inequality and inequity. To understand the impact on the world's children, it's helpful to distinguish the three channels through which children's lives are being affected by COVID-19. The first channel is through infection with the virus. Thankfully, children have been largely spared from the severe symptomatic reactions, which have been more common among older people. Of course, that pattern is changing a bit with um, the rollout of the vaccine amongst the older populations. We are seeing changes in the presentation in the populations that are presenting to hospital um, with COVID-19. However, overall, um, uh, children have been largely spared um, from, from that impact. And this is not ignoring the fact that there have been cases of hospitalizations and deaths of children due to the virus but fortunately these have been exceptions or likely related to prior conditions. While the clinical pattern, epidemiology and transmission does appear to continue to change and be, 
What has been more common is for children to tragically lose a family member or caregiver. The psychological impacts of such loss on children should not be overlooked. And for those of us who are health and social care providers and professionals who have contact with vulnerable families, it's important that we know how to signpost families to resources to help understand and cope with coronavirus and its impacts. So just from an individual level, this is just a, a handful of some resources and that we might familiarise ourselves to be able to signpost families that we have contact with. And many of these can be found on the local authority website and there are another um, sources of resources. So it's really helpful for us in our day to day roles to familiarise ourselves um, with, with this information. The second channel through which children's lives are affected by COVID is through the socioeconomic effects of the virus and the related measures put in place to suppress and control the pandemic. At the start of the pandemic, when we were scrambling to understand how best to protect the population at large and each other, and were yet to see how the pandemic might spread and the nature of its virulence, child health and social care services were severely disrupted these included outpatient services for chronic conditions, social care and child protection services, sexual and reproductive health services, preventive services that support early years development, routine checks and immunisations, and care management for children requiring additional care, um, and uh, such as therapeutic interven and interventions for those living with disabilities, as well as um, support services for families. And while these services have largely now resumed, we're finding, and we're finding new ways of working, we're still trying to understand the impact of this time where we have seen such disruption to protective services for children and young people. Disrupted access to health, education, and social services worsen health outcomes in disadvantaged children and young people. The diagram on the, the bottom right is a famous pictorial representation of the social determinants of health. And during childhood, we're especially vulnerable to the main determinants of health, living conditions, family income, employment, education, and access to health services. We know that many of the medical problems seen in deprived children flow from restricted opportunities to be healthy, exposure to poverty, unhealthy environments, lower quality nutrition, poor air quality, substandard housing and chronic stress. We also know that there are higher numbers of black and minority ethnic people in lower plate employment or living in deprived areas. COVID-19 has already cost, caused the most aggressive decline in the global economy seen in modern times. And one of the biggest barriers is the stigma around poverty. 70% of children in poverty have parents who have at least one working job. People are trying to get out of poverty, but they're there because there are problems in the system. This is an extract from the United Nations Convention of Rights of the Child, through which child rights have been enshrined in international law. And when we relate it to the situation, it's quite clear to see that the COVID-19 syndemic is a child rights crisis. Now, I'm not saying all this to depress you. I'm saying it because as public service providers, we have a responsibility to advocate for children. So it's important that we understand these dynamics so that we can develop consistent and innovative ways of supporting our children and young people to thrive. Within family homes, the unintended consequences of lockdown affect poor children the most. Increased risk of neglect and domestic violence, children going hungry as food banks try to meet the increasing demand and rising levels of food insecurity. Lockdown, which had been in poor quality and overcrowded housing with inequitable access to safe green space, disrupts the lives of some children more than others. 
These impacts have profound effects on children's mental health, mental well-being, social development, safety, privacy and economic security. And while we still cannot predict how this pandemic will play out or for how long, what is certain is that unless there is a proactive and concerted policy to focus on vulnerable children, they will face the brunt of it. Families are currently the fastest rising homeless group in Europe. The majority are single parent families, often with a female adult. And these families are often more likely to sleep at friends' houses um, than, uh, uh, for example, the uh, single um, males who are the, the largest population group of homeless. Um, but, but, you know, this situation where families are more likely to sleep at friends' houses means they're less visible and not seen in society. However, even with the eviction ban in place, tens of thousands of people were tipped into homelessness last winter. The three most common triggers of homelessness during the period were households no longer being able to stay with families and friends, the loss of a private tenancy and domestic abuse. And compared to homeless single adults, homeless families tend to have over-representation of migrants. And with child homelessness, there is increased risk of severe physical and mental ill health, including developmental delay, emotional and behavioural difficulties and other issues. Polly Neat, the chief executive of Shelter, said uh, to say the last year has been difficult for homeless families is a gross understatement. It's been atrocious. Months of lockdown and school closures spent in cramped, shoddy, temporary accommodation with no space to learn or work and often without access to basics like the internet or a washing machine. And we must be aware that children are invisible in the housing system. They don't have housing rights of their own. And in the Department of Work and Pensions, families are only allowed two children to get benefits, which is a sad, a sad uh, and quite shocking discrimination against anyone who has three or more children and every child in principle. A study by the Sutton Trust and London School of Economics looked at the potential impact of school closures and, loss, and lost learning on employment and earning later on in life. Their an analysis illustrated that the daily losses of time spent on learning during lockdown were more significant for children from lower socioeconomic groups. Looking at children's experiences of home learning in the UK during the pandemic, specifically since the first lockdown, the number of hours of learning received by secondary school children in households in the highest earning families decreased from 7.2 hours per day to approximately 5.1 hours per day during lockdown. And in the lowest earning families decreased from 6.2 hours per day to 3.9 hours. So quite a significant difference um, between the, the highest and lowest quintiles. The study cross-analyzed labor force data as well as calculating the number of days of school lost, the duration of school closures in England, and data on the duration and effectiveness of temporary homeschooling. The findings of the study are quite stark, that the learning loss associated with COVID-19 school closures may result in a loss in, a, in employment adjusted gross earnings of approximately 22 um, £1,500 for men from low, low socioeconomic groups and £14,600 for women from low socioeconomic groups, thus a magnifying of intergenerational effects and inequity. Social distancing measures and school closures have interrupted educational trajectories and this disruption to education has the potential for lifetime impacts on human capability in all settings. Teachers and parents must certainly be commended for developing online resources under huge pressure and in difficult circumstances. But for some children, the lack of internet, electronic devices and quiet space at home 
has further exacerbated inequalities in educational outcomes. School closures have a greater impact in children with disabilities and learning difficulties, and also in low and middle income countries with reduced access to online learning. For high income countries, the effectiveness of mitigation measures such as Zoom classes and home learning has been estimated to range from 15% to 60%, reflecting both variation of household access to technology and the expected effectiveness of what is offered. Globally, children and young people from rural areas have rates of internet access that are 16 percentage points lower than their urban peers. More significantly, home internet access for children and young people whose households belong to the poorest quintile in their countries is 42 percentage points lower than that of their peers from the richest households in the same countries, which further exacerbates existing inequalities in access to education. Significantly expanding internet access in homes, communities and schools is vital to ensure that this and subsequent generations of children and young people can acquire the knowledge and skills they need to support a sustainable future. So, how are children's lives affected by the COVID-19 syndemic? Well, the effects are certainly greater than the rates of infection. Even of the significant effects of the disrupted access to health services and extending, extended waiting times, the increased risk of unwitnessed abuse or exploitation, and the immediate impacts of loss of income to household. The longer term impacts on health, well being, literacy, professional opportunity, social mobility, housing, and intergenerational effects are potentially devastating. It's the broader impacts that risk being catastrophic and amongst the most lasting consequences for society as a whole. The rights of children to be listened to is enshrined in international law in the, the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child. Throughout the initial response planning for COVID, there was a lack of meaningful involvement of children and young people, but this is now improving as children's participation is increasing and so is their empowerment. This, however, still cannot be generalised and it's important for us to continually ask ourselves which children have participated, which children have not been considered, have been dismissed or not empowered to speak. So what can we as health and social care professionals and public service providers do? We can continue to protect services for children and have health equity as a central objective. We can ensure we affirm the dignity and rights of children and young people. And we can make sure we know how to signpost families to resources which help children cope with and understand coronavirus and its impacts. We can advocate for access to protective services housing and welfare and employment policies that support children and families, both on an individual and population level. And we can use telehealth and technologies with a child and family centred approach. We can maintain eyes on the child and deliver essential services face to face where required. And what about advocating for child rights during this, this whole period? Well, collaboration with key partners locally, nationally and internationally to discover and disseminate evidence to mitigate pandemic impacts in children and young people. Working with ch civil society, especially children and young people themselves in all aspects of the pandemic and also mobilizing international professional societies. We can ensure that vulnerable children and young people benefit from interventions for COVID-19 and research findings. And advance child rights, social justice and health equity.
so that's really um, what I wanted to, to share with you. Um, in terms, I tried to keep it more as a, 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 lo a local and national view, but um, please do have a look at uh, my paper, um, which is in Archives of Disease of Children, and um, which gives a more global perspective. And um, these are some references. Thank you.